this science developed by Muslims many years ago. And that's the verse that I'm referring to as having the word Quran or a form of the word Quran in it. A form of the word Quran in it. It starts with that. It's the very first word that the angel Gabriel spoke to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. He said to him this word, Iqara, which is a form of the word Quran. It means you recite. And he said, but I don't recite. I'm not a reciter. La Anabikari. Then the angel grabbed him and squeezed him and let him go. And he told him again, Ikara, you recite. And he said, I'm Ummi. I'm illiterate. I don't know how to read and write. And again, the angel squeezed him again and released him. Ikara, you recite. Now what should he recite? What should he say? Before I give you that answer, I want to tell you something. Well, this event which took place in a cave called Hirat, in the mountain called Jabal Nur, mountain of light, this happened 1400 years ago, more than that actually, a little bit more than that, on a special night in the month of Ramadan. Ramadan starting tomorrow, is it? So this is a good time for me to talk about it, isn't it? But on the night of power, as it's called, in Ramadan is when this actually happened. Ikura. And guess what? This was an event foretold of in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Go read it. I'll let you read it on your own and discover and see if you can pick up, but I will share with you one word. They use the word cry instead of the word ikara. Because in the days when the Bible was translated, a crier was not somebody that was going, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. A crier was a person who used to announce or recite. An announcer and a reciter. Somebody used to memorize the events of the day. Then in the evening as the sun would go down, he'd walk around town and cry out the events of the day. He was called the town crier. The one who goes out reciting the events of the day. So, if you look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, you're going to discover an amazing thing. An illiterate man that can't read or write is being ordered to cry out or recite. What shall I recite? And it comes. And I'll give it to you in the Arabic. I'll give it to you in the Arabic. In the Arabic. خلق الإنسان من ألق إقرا وربك الأكرم الذي يرام بالكرم ألام الإنسان ما لم يرام Those are the first words that came. And if Allah forgive me for my poor Arabic, I'll try to give you the translation of it to Texas English. The first word, recite. Well, we already know that. We're experts on that word now. I said it a bunch, right? Ekorah, recite. In the name of your Lord who created, created mankind from an alaq. Recite and your Lord is so generous who taught man the use of the pen. Taught man what he didn't know. What's an alaq? You're supposed to ask me, what's alaq? Because I left it in Arabic. The word I didn't say was in Arabic. Didn't give you a translation. The reason is because it, it, we don't have one word in English. It takes several words in English to explain this word alaq. But if you go to the Arabic dictionary, Arabic English dictionary, and look it up, you will find it has several understandings in the English language. One, strangely enough, is a leech. You know what a leech is, right? Anybody have a lawyer? <laughs> but no, just kidding. No, a leech, you know that, that little creature which is in the water down in the Amazon River? You go swimming and it gets on you and starts sucking blood out of you. Well, it is like a lawyer. I forgot about that. Anyhow, so, <laughs> so what happens? We have now this clear meaning of something that attaches 
penetrates the skin it starts to draw blood out got it a leech olive but another meaning for it it says is something that is hanging or clinging like a refrigerator magnet would cling that can be called an olive because it's hanging on the third meaning is a clot whenever you have uh, a hemorrhage of some kind you have bleeding is going on here and then it starts to coagulate and form this clot in Arabic that's called a alak now what's interesting about this is that all three of those meanings exactly describe what it looks like when a baby is first conceived when the egg is fertilized and what happens inside of the uterus when this egg or an Arabic zagat attaches to the wall of the uterus in the womb what happens it penetrates and begins to draw blood out hangs attaches itself and forms a clot all at the same time perfect word perfect word you know who said it was perfect not me because I'm not I'm not in that business Dr. Keith Moore one of the top embryologists maybe in the world in Toronto Canada and we have him on video we videotaped this and we have it on our website you can watch him say it you can watch him explain it and tell you much better than me all about this subject in fact we have about seven scientists on our website talking about the various disciplines and how that the Quran has explained these to the extent that people are saying how could somebody 1,400 years ago come up with this stuff regardless and even the smartest uh, professor or the biggest alim in the world 1,400 years ago couldn't come up with it how about a man in the desert that can't even read and write strange I'm going to make a summary of several points because I'd like to encourage you to use our website to get the details islamalways.com I-S-L-A-M-A-L-W-A-Y-S dot com and when you go there you're going to find a lot of other websites that we hook to because we set it up as a system there are things that some people are interested in more so than others it's easier to remember it we have Islam tomorrow we also have Islam yesterday we also have today Islam and we have Islam always for those who like to listen we have hear Islam those who would like to view it we have watch Islam and they're all dot com but you don't have to remember any of that just always remember when you always would like to go to learn about Islam always go to Islam always dot com thank you very much now I see the I brainwash you that's the end of the commercial I'll go back to the program <laughs> already in progress well, you got to put up with that. You know, we're here in the West. That's what you're used to. It's the TV. I'm sorry. But it's an amazing thing when you find scientists who are saying, how could this be? It's not possible. How could the trimesters, for instance, be described exactly in the Quran? And they only come up with this a few, just recently coming up with the idea of trimesters in the West. How is it in the Quran that is describing, as we already mentioned, how lightning is formed? Because that's definitely something that only in the recent years people have understood that the formation of lightning comes as this result of this positive negative charge in the ions when the hail goes up and down. And I'll let you read the rest of it on the website. How about this one, though? When in the Quran it talks about what it what mountains are like on the other side we all see the top part of the mountain right you know what an iceberg is right the iceberg floating along in the water but the biggest part of the iceberg is under the water isn't it but did you know mountains are like that well I never thought about that when was the last time I ever crawled underneath a, a mountain and looked at it we're not big enough to do that that's impossible nobody could even think about that until recent years and the description in the Quran talking about what it looks like underneath the mountain okay now stop and think what this means underneath the mountain 
And first of all, you can't even climb on top of one, probably, without you know, having some serious problems. But how do you climb underneath a mountain and look underneath? Even if you were there, it would be dark, I think, right? How would you know what you're looking at? But it's described in the Quran, and you can go to the books and geography and look at this when they show you how does this work, and it's on our website. And it looks like these long teeth or long sticks or long tent pegs. And the word in Arabic, autad. Autad. And it's in the first surah in Juz Amma, chapter uh, 78 of the Quran. Amma yatasa'alun. Read it and see when Allah talks about this. He's describing what is holding the earth and how it keeps it from shaking. And he describes how these long, long tent pegs are going down into the ground. Is that amazing? I guess so, because there's not too many mountains out in the desert. Even the one we're talking about, Jabal Nur, is not a huge mountain. Mount Uhud, you've all heard about Mount Uhud in Medina, right? That's also not very big. I think this building is bigger than that, okay? They talk about mountains such as in Safa and Marwa. If you haven't been there, you assume these are big mountains. And actually, it's like a two-story building. That's about it. So how could somebody in the desert come up with this description? That's what I saw. There are a number of other miracles that we find in the scientific arena in the Quran. But I've mentioned some from literature point of view, the linguistics. I've also mentioned now some of the things that I think are sort of flashy. But how about this? I want to talk about something about the Quran that is still maybe a miracle, but something sweet, something very nice. I personally had it happen to me, and I've seen it in the last 14 years many times. And that is that when a new person, and I, I was trying to convert a Muslim to become a Christian. I used to be a preacher, okay? And I wanted to convert this guy, come be a Christian. Let Jesus save you, right? Okay. In the process, though, of my debating with this man, whenever he would like to recite the Quran and then tell me the meaning, I found myself saying to him, would you mind reciting that again? Because I'd like to hear that again. And he said, well, you don't know what it means. I said, it just sounds nice. Uh, just do it slow, though. Because he, he might say, well, my collector generally and see what do. I said, say it slow. And he looked at me strange. Why? I said, I don't know. Can you just say it slow? Well, I said, whoa. Say it again. He said, I didn't even tell you what it means. I said, that's nice. Those who have never heard somebody recite the Quran might find that strange. But how about this? I have many friends, by the way, in New York and Washington, D.C., places like this that are taxi drivers. And when a taxi, a Muslim, a lot of taxi drivers are Muslims, by the way. When a Muslim is riding around in his car, what he likes to do, all Muslims, even if he's not such a good Muslim, he still likes to do what? We love to listen to Quran. It's very common to find a Muslim has Quran, a CD or a tape, and it, or if it's in some countries, they have the radio station having Quran, they like to listen to it. So, one told me this, and it's not just one story, I've heard it several times, but I'll just tell you this one particular one. He said that when some customers got into his cab, and after they said where they want to go, he reached over to turn it off, and they said, whoa, stop, leave that music on, that sounds nice. So they left it on, and they were saying, what kind of music is this? This is nice. He said, what do you feel? He said, I feel peaceful. I feel peaceful when I hear it. Now, there's no instruments musical instruments that go with Quran. This is only this instrument right here, the voice. And so when people say music is not legal in Islam, that's not exactly correct. It depends on what instrument. This instrument is very much an obligation for you to use it. But this instrument, no. <laughs> that's not a part of Islam. The, the guitar. But when you hear somebody with a good voice, I don't have a good voice, by the way. They never, even though I was a music minister, I was in charge of keyboard, uh, orchestration, choral, things like that. But don't sing. That was real. Don't. 
If this guy's going to sing, we're leaving. <laughs> In fact, the one even told me something about <laughs> if you have to sing, could you at least wait till we get the collection first? <laughs>